A brutal terrorist attack rocked Israel last Saturday. As emotions are high and propaganda floods social media, this episode is broken into three parts. One, establish the facts of the Hamas terrorist attack in Israel. Two, provide a brief history of the Palestine-Israel conflict, starting with British colonialism. Three, cover the reactions of American leaders, some of which have clearly not learned from the Iraq war. And as usual, we provide some tips for navigating a stressful time as a Catholic and encourage you to pray for peace. All this and more on this edition of The Loopcast. God bless everyone and welcome back to The Loopcast. Today it is me, Erica, and Josh. Um, we all experienced the events over the weekend just as you did. Uh, they were shocking and saddening, as I imagine most of the world feels right now. Uh, so we're going to spend this episode really breaking down three different threads on what happened over the weekend. Fortunately, we're kind of at a point in time where it's not as fresh and a lot of the facts are known and we can really try to just lay down the facts of exactly what happened on Saturday, uh, understand a little bit of the historical context of the dispute between Palestinians and the Israelis. And then also what I don't think is being said elsewhere, we want to add some real Catholic context to ways to live in a time that feel very tense and feel very stressful. Um, hopefully some good reminders to bring us up at the end. So it's not going to be all sad, but we really do want to do our best journalistic integrity of just laying down exactly what happens, try to take a lot of the emotion out of it. And we have the pers perfect person for it. If you've ever listened to this, Erica, of course, uh, came with the oh, research. Shucks. Uh, Erica, can you just lay down exactly what happened on Saturday in Israel? All right. Well, like you said, we're a few days out by the time we're recording this. And so we have more of the facts of what happened. So on Saturday morning, which is a holy day, the beginning of a holiday weekend in Israel, there was a, a terrible, brutal attack. There's no way around it by Hamas, which came up from the south, the Gaza Strip, south of Israel, into um, some southern kibbutzes, music festival involved, all, the, all of these um, civilian targets, really. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down with a few facts here. And I took these numbers from two sources that I think, uh, you know, we're trying to get the exact numbers, but I took them from Al Jazeera, which is certainly not exactly a pro-Israel source. And I also took some from Daily Signal and Daily Wire, so more on the other side. But in the end, it looks like the death toll um, from Israel right now, of Israelis, mostly civilians, lots of women and children, were over 1,000. I saw numbers as high as 1,200 this morning. There's about 2,600 wounded and over 100 hostages with multiple um, Israelis still unaccounted for. So what happened? Hamas, which is uh, a pro-Palestinian terrorist organization, we're going to talk a little bit in a, in a minute about what we mean by Palestinian um, but it's a pro-Palestinian, it's a terrorist organization as defined by the UN, and it was founded in 1987 uh, as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And for the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, it's really, Hamas has enjoyed political control of the Gaza Strip, which is territory, like I said, to the south of Israel. Um, a lot of the news that we've seen in the last 10 to 20 years coming out of Israel has been focused on attacks from the North, Lebanon, uh, and a group called Hezbollah firing rockets around Tel Aviv. But this was a surprise attack, and it came from the South. This, this attack on Saturday was, you can only characterize it, I think, as a massive intelligence and defense failure. It seemed to come as a complete surprise to the Israeli government. Uh, it was clearly highly planned and coordinated at around 6.30 a.m., we saw bulldozers taking down portions of the heavily fortified wall that Israel has built between its uh, between Israel and the Gaza Strip, where many Palestinians live. Uh, we saw paragliders gliding over in the air into Israel and dropping soldiers, um, and we saw just thousands of fighters coming up from the south entering. Jewish kibbutzes, which are like small settlement commune type uh, living arrangements, like small villages. Like I said, the large music festival was attacked, over 260 people killed there. And just horrific stories of, of fighters going house to house, killing whole families in their beds, um, children being killed, uh, women being raped, um, just terrible. It was, it was a terrible event. Israel has 
I think, every right to defend itself against this kind and they, of... And they did pretty, pretty much immediately declared war. Yeah. So immediate response from Israel. We had 200 air raids within the first 24 hours in a bombardment of Gaza. Um, now, Gaza, you have to understand, and again, we'll get into this, but it's very densely populated. It is almost impossible to have a targeted attack, although Israel has said we're only dropping bombs on you know military targets, but it is inevitable in a in a place that is that densely populated that there won't be civilian. To give deaths. people perspective of how populated, I believe it's like 2.2 million people within 140 square miles. So we're talking about very small. And then Hamas, their thing is they have their headquarters under hospitals. Uh, they hide in schools. Like these are these terrorists, basically like Hezbollah in the north. Correct. Right? So the, they're they're intentionally hiding behind civilians. And so and in refugee camps as well. Right. And of course, despicable. But the military strategy, I think, is let's provoke a big enough response to kill enough civilians to make people angry enough um, to anger people internationally to garner uh, sympathy. And and of course, like I think now is an important time to get into the, the history here, because there are Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip, not by their own choice, uh, that have historically been in the region for a long time that are not terrorists and they're not. Uh, they're not looking to kill Jews. They're just, they feel disenfranchised. They want to go back to where they were previously before Israel came along. So uh, I think, th- then now, now I think we get into the second for threat because we understand now the facts. Of course, there's the reactions to all of this, but uh, this isn't, this has been characterized as a religious uh, struggle. And the reality of it is it's more of a nationalist struggle. So the Palestinians, and I believe the ni- around the 1900s, uh, they were starting to come up with their national identity as the group of people that have lived in that region we now know as kind of Israel-Palestine uh, historically for hundreds of years. And then at the same time, uh, the Jews were just coming off of World War II, horrible, unspeakable crimes done to them. They're starting their national identity as Zionism, looking for a place that they can live to have their own nation to identify as a nation so that they won't be infringed upon by Other people, of course, looking to seek harm to the Jews. Right. And part of that, the reason why Western nations were sympathetic to Israel's, you know, the Jewish people's call for their own state was precisely because not only because obviously the Nazis exterminated like what, 6 million Jews, and there was Jews that were killed in Russia. But then you had boats full of Jewish people going to New York that were turned around by, you know, President Roosevelt. You had Jews mistreated in other countries. And so there is that element of Western guilt. And, you know, I, I get it. And actually, so that's kind of what we can't let this happen again. We got to give them their own country and, and we make sure we can defend it. So um, there's a little bit of that. And and then what you say about, I think I want to just kind of tweak a little what you said, Tom. It's like you said, it's not, you know, everyone wants to focus as if it's just a religious war and there's more to it than that. I just want to make sure our listeners understand we're saying it's, uh, there are, you know, nations, cultures, peoples, as well as religion. So yes, religion still plays a major factor, no question, but too many people in the secular world view it as only a religious or holy war. And we're trying to say, no, Yes, religion is a factor, but it's not the only factor. So just wanted to make sure people understood. Yeah, exactly. The reason I brought that up is because before that early 1900s area, Jewish people and Muslims existed peacefully in that region for the most part. There wasn't a broad scale constant attack that we've been seeing starting in the early 1900s to now. Um, so it's not like, so I think the way that people frame this is, oh, they've always hated yeah, each other. Yeah, for 20 it's centuries, back, da, da, hundreds da, 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 and yeah. hundreds of years. That's not true. This is yeah. not true. Amalek That's... and the Assyrians. Yeah. And, right, and it actually right. <laughs> ironically started with the Brits. So Erica, I, once again, we want to get back to the sources of, of the facts here. The Brits were kind of responsible for, for setting this up poorly. If you want to get into that, I think it'd be helpful to understand. Yeah, look, like I'm an Anglophile, so I don't want to trash on the Brits, but the fact remains that I'm happy to. the way the, okay go for it okay I'll, I have free reign on the <laughs> Brits I guess thanks Pogo so yeah it, the way it, it there's there's no way around it the the influence of Western powers particularly Great Britain in the Middle East region when in the wake of World War One they start chopping up and dividing up old colonies and in the Middle East we also saw it in Africa. Um, 
just sort of laying down these rant, these lines that possibly with the best of intentions, but with terrible unintended consequences, they're like, okay, well, all the Palestinians will now live here. We saw this in India too, actually, when they partitioned off the Muslim and the Hindu parts of India. So, okay, all the Palestinians will live here happily and the Jews will live here and the Syrians will live here, the Lebanese, with without an awareness of the complexity um, of the interaction of these groups. We saw it in Yugoslavia, right, after the fall of the Soviet Union, where we have these outside powers like the UN come in and say, okay, well, we're just going to tell you where to live. And they lay down these borders that really don't make sense. And I'm, I'm Croatian. They, they don't ask for info. I'm Croatian, Croatian, so I yeah. feel that very strongly. It was a horrible, bloody civil war, and it was all because of these bad lines. Yeah, and to this day, the borders are contested because they didn't actually consult with the ethnic groups or the religious groups that have historically lived there. So in in the post World War One era, we have the British uh, promising. They promised the area of Palestine subs- in, in sequence first to the the Zionist Jews, most of whom were secular Jews from Europe seeking their own homeland, to the Zionist Jews, to Meccans, to themselves, and there was even a portion that was going to go to France. So they Britain made all these sorts of promises. They ended up with the sort of jigsaw puzzle of these really tiny areas like the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, Judea, uh, the northern, you know, North Lebanon, East Jerusalem. It, it was such a mess. Uh, in 1947, we get a more a partition of Palestine in a way that made somewhat more sense, and the UN approved it. But promptly, within 12 months, we had a major Arab-Israeli war um, to try and settle these boundaries, and, and basically, it's been on and off war ever since in different forms. The Palestinians after the 1948 war essentially became stateless. And I think it's here, we just want to reiterate that, look, not all Palestinians are Hamas. Not all Palestinians are Muslim. There is a significant Christian minority among them. Um, They become stateless and basically the last 60, 70 years have been uh, trying to find ways for them to to regain a homeland that they really feel they have a right to. Um, and there have been atrocities, I guess is the right word, on, on both sides. You mentioned, Tom, that many Palestinians now sequestered in the Gaza Strip are not there by choice. I think it's over 180,000 of them have been forcibly resettled by Israel. And we're not just talking terrorist fighters who uh, did this terrible attack this last weekend, but we're talking families and children, Christian minorities, Muslim minorities being told, okay, you have 24 hours to pick up everything you have, leave your farms in Israeli territory and get to the Gaza Strip. Where with no choice. This is with not, no choice. You know. No choice and no warning. And so it's been, it's been a terrible, terrible time um, for the Palestinians uh, as well here. And yeah, again, whenever the Western powers get involved and say, okay, well, we're just going to fix it for all you little brown people doesn't always end up so well i mean there are times (laughs) when the united states can exercise a little bit of um diplomacy and be helpful i mean i certainly think president trump's actions over the last uh, few years when he was in office to try to get more muslim states to recognize the state of israel that i think that was helpful um you know i i i mean i do think it was good that there was an agreement between Egypt and Israel with, you know, uh, back in what, 1979. So, I mean, it's not like, um, it's always been for ill. There have been attempts to try to make things better. I mean, I know that Clinton's talks broke down all that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of times people are like trying to, you know, tr- treat Yasser Arafat as if he was some sort of, you know, statesman. It was a joke, but there have been attempts. Who's that? Who is that? Yasser Arafat was the guy who was head of the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Uh, that became the PLA when they got actual authority over lands. So, um, but I th- I'm pretty convinced that Yasser Arafat was a terrorist. But, um, you know, so I, the, the thing about this, though, is um, like when we're talking about the Gaza Strip, you know, Hamas came to power with the elections like in 2006. And it's basically, you know, a, a terrorist organization. And they're having, no, it is a terrorist organization. And they yeah. haven't, yeah, mm-hmm. they haven't had elections, what, since then? <laughs> right. You know, Israel's response to that is basically to hermetically seal that area and not allow much 
you know, in the way of medicine or imports to come into the country, uh, into the Gaza Strip. And so it's fueled a lot of, you know, discord, I guess. But, you know, they did give power to a terrorist organization, Hamas. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a, I don't know, it's tough. I mean, the thing is, Israel needs, to, you know, in terms of their response to this, we have to hope that Israel will come up with a proportionate response. And I think Israel's ways of looking at it is, well, they're, first of all, they're not Catholic, so they're not going to be concerned as much with just war theory, but they're not going to be concerned about a proportionate response. They want to make sure the response isn't necessarily proportionate, but uh, their biggest res- uh, concern is that it's going to be a, a deterrent. You could even say an eradication. I mean, they've said we will destroy Hamas over this. There's rhetoric on both sides for eradication, and sometimes some of it might be true, that what they truly what they truly feel. But, you know, this this attack came on the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, which is a case where, um, you know, Arabs attacked the state of Israel back in 60, um, 68, right? Golly, 73. 67. Well, there was the right. attack in 60. Oh, yeah, that one. Okay. 60, 73. <laughs> there's so many. I get yeah, confused. But yeah, oh. so in, this is the you know, anniversary of that attack. And again, the, the attacks, you know, when Israel was attacked, you know, fifty some years ago, it was it caught them bl- uh, flat footed and blindsided, and they, you know, it took them a while to regroup. But then when they when they did get, you know, adjusted to it, they went on the offensive, and they actually expanded their territories by taking land in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and even the Sinai Peninsula, and that's what they gave back to Egypt when Egypt decided, to, yeah, okay, well, we'll just get we'll give up on our territorial claims. We'll try to give up on trying to destroy the state of Israel. But the is Israel, like I say, isn't going to be concerned too much with making sure it's a proportionate response because they want to make sure that as history looks back at it, that, that people who attacked Israel were like, that was dumb because after we got after we attacked Israel, bad things happened to us. That's that that's what they're looking at. They are principally looking at their response as a deterrent for any future actions against them. Yeah, and I think that historically it's of a pattern, right? I was looking this up and I found some statistics um, from, and again, these were, I tried to triangulate these because there are a lot, there's a lot of propaganda around everything that happens in that region. But t- um, typically, basically since the Six Day War in 1967, which is what I was thinking yeah, of. Yeah, I meant to say um, that initially. Israel, yeah. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> there's, it's very <laughs> complex. Um, Israel inflicts casualties at a rate um, of an average of 25 times higher than what it suffers in any of these terrorist attacks. So you're looking at um, the another stat that I got from Al Jazeera was that between 2008 and 2023, we've seen 6,400 Palestinian deaths from in retaliation to just over 300 Israeli deaths until this weekend, of course. That, that totally blows these numbers out of the water. But I think what you're saying, Josh, plays out in the stats that typically the response is what what one could call disproportionate. On um, oh, go ahead. Well, I, one thing that I think is important and that I want to leave people with here is it's easy to see the horrible thing that happened over the week and then hear what's coming from Israel about how basically they need to put dogs down. Uh, there's a lot of dehumanizing language that I think is really dangerous for everyone to just take at face value because that's how basically you encourage mass deaths and war crimes. I mean, there's no way around it. Like it it really makes me think I really had to dig into this a little bit deeper because if you just go on the surface, you just see a lot of very uh, pro-Israel propaganda to basically give them a hall pass to do whatever they want. And it really reminds me a lot of the Afghanistan war when 9-11 happens. And basically, we were all emotionally hoodwinked into bombing Iraq and Afghanistan under the guise that there's weapons of mass destruction there. We come to find out, of course, that's not true. And we were in a war that we were in a war for many years. Then we left. Embarrassingly, nothing happened. How many Americans lost arms or legs or their lives over there? All for what? A more destabilized region? That's, That's all I want to say is like, 
Well, it's, I just want to... It's dangerous when you get whipped up like I, this. I, I'm agreeing with your conclusion. I just wanted to say with regards to Afghanistan, the immediate war in 2001 was to try to depose the Taliban-backed government, which had financed a lot of the... It got, was involved in the attacks of 9-11. Not maybe as much as, you know, money from Saudi Arabia, but there was an element. In, so that's what we try to do. We take out the Taliban-backed government in Afghanistan. Your critique is better when you're talking about Iraq, which is faulty or BS intelligence that would claim that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, therefore, you know, go after Saddam Hussein. Um, but I, so just to clarify, I mean, like there is, a, there was a legitimate reason to take out the Taliban back government in Afghanistan. Now that doesn't mean we should stay there for 20 years. Um, anyway. Yeah. So exit strategies. But the are reason good. I bring this up is because there's many Palestinians that, through no fault of their own, are locked in this basic open air prison in Gaza Strip. It's blocked on the Egypt side. It's blocked on the the Israel side. Um, they've had marches to to try to go back to their homeland, um, and they've basically framed it as well. They were throwing stones at us, and therefore they shot back with bullets. Like it's it's to treat this as like a simple, you know, Hamas is is and Palestine are evil. Uh, Muslims, I think, is too simplistic and can whip people into a frenzy to dehumanize them to take lives. And so the reason I want to bring this up is because the reactions, especially from Americans and people that are running for president of the United States, uh, were not shocking if you've seen their history, but kind of shocking on face value. I think Tucker actually did a great job on this. He, he brought on Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah, we'll we'll link that. We're going to link it. But but Nikki Haley went on Fox News. Nikki Haley went on Fox News. And said out loud, uh, you know, after what happened, finish them, finish them. Iran's behind it. Finish them. They hate us just as much. Uh, Lindsey Graham basically called them religious Nazis, said that we should be bombing uh, Iran right now because of the connection with Hezbollah and uh, Hamas. It was almost shocking to me, just such a quick reaction to like, yeah, let's start a world war, basically, because, of course, China backs Iran. And that what what that would do to the world order is is crazy. Like it, it seemed like such a surprising reaction, but not really understanding that these people really want us in these kind of long, like long term conflicts. Uh, Josh, you're kind of the the guy on this, you know, bombing foreign countries. Yeah, and taxes. I mean, the thing what, is, what was this reaction like to you? You look at well, you mentioned Iraq, so we attacked and invaded that country in 2003, and it had a massive destabilizing effect in the region. Um, I think the United States it, internally, domestically, you know, it, it was a major distraction and it caused a lot of problems. And, um, you know, look, we have a Southern border we need to take care of. We have a fentanyl crisis. You know, there's a lot of problems we need to take care of here domestically, but our, uh, foreign policy at the beginning of the 21st century was, so focused on, you know, I, again, I think when he, when you look at Iraq, I can't help but think it was George W. Bush trying to get revenge over his father because Saddam Hussein had attempted, you know, put a hit out on his dad. Um, I think that, I think that's part of it. But if you look at, you know, if, if any sober analysis of foreign policy in the United States over the last, you know, 30, 40 years, you'd have to look at Iraq as a major blunder. And the American people are very clear on this. Republican Party got their butts kicked in 2006 and 2008. And even into the 2016 campaign, you had a lot of Republicans who were still sort of like, well, I mean, patriotism means having a strong military, which means starting wars. And Donald Trump was like, this is stupid. The Iraq war was was really stupid. Why don't you understand this? And, I think that's a direct quote. I mean, yeah. it's not even that <laughs> far off, right? And, and, and the voters were like, yeah, you know, a lot of these voters were like, they had lost, you know, uncles or brothers, uh, to, to the, and sisters to this fighting. And they're like, this guy gets it. This was stupid. And, um, now we see, so, I mean, you would think by now, 20 years later, everyone was like, that was, that was a major disaster going into Iraq, totally destabilizing the reason region, it, it allowed, uh, you know, the government to fall and a worse government to go into Iraq. You also had ISIS running the region and slaughtering Christians. Um, and you had the displacement of so many Catholics and other Christians in Iraq. 
Uh, my good friend Andrew Walther, uh, may rest in peace, uh, dedicated, uh, worked with the Knights of Columbus to get a lot of aid to Christians in the Middle East. Other organizations did well, but it was a total blunder to be involved in the Iraq War. I mean, I'm willing to admit I, I supported it at the time, and I, it was it was foolish. So the lesson here would be, my gosh, no way would I want to, you know, talk about bombing Iran. So someone like Nikki Haley. Like, dude, are you out of your mind? This is why I've been so adamant against this person running for president. She wants to go back to the 2004 GOP, where all you care about is cutting corporate taxes and bombing foreign countries. The last thing they want to talk about is actually fixing the problems here at home, being concerned about marriages and families, and you know, making sure we have good jobs to pay the bills. They don't care. They don't care. They... I mean, they look at the American people as an endless supply of bodies and treasure to use to start wars in the Middle East. And for what? I don't even understand this. It's like, you know, the, you know, if if you're Bill Crystal, he's a neocon. He was a guy at the Weekly Standard. He absolutely despises Trump. And Bill Crystal is probably, you know, super pro-Israel. He's a, a Jewish man. Super pro-Israel. He thinks the United States is a piggy bank and, you know, like an endless amount of treasure and toil and bodies to support the state of Israel, whatever it does. Look, if that's what you think, Bill Crystal, fine. But why would, why would Nikki Haley and Lindsey Graham, why would, they, why would these other people be so rabid for war? Right. And I think that for me, watching the reactions, and we can get into like the reactions from the left as well, but the to hear the same kind of rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration. I mean, we lit up the White House in Israeli colors, promising every resource, military supplies, sending probably now a second carrier group over to the region, you know, purportedly to deter Iran from getting involved. But to hear that same rhetoric from the GOP and then, you know, from the Biden House that like, okay. this is go, go, go. Well, Nikki mm -hmm. Haley's rhetoric was horrible. Joe Biden lighting up the tree, you know, the Chris, the White House or whatever, the colors of your ally was attacked isn't actually the worst thing in the world. I mean, the All thing right. is, no, the, here's the, the worst thing was him calling a lid at noon the next day. He right. taking a nap. Well, and taking four days to make a public appearance. Well, I just, the attack was Saturday. He didn't show up till Tuesday. I feel like Catholics have an opportunity to be a good voice of reason, like John Paul II warned us mm -hmm. not to get involved in Iraq. And if more Catholics like me had listened to him then, we'd have been a lot better off. The fact is, you have some people in this country like these warmongers, like Nikki Haley and Lindsey Graham, who, I don't know, I guess, per, supposedly they're from South Carolina, but you might as well just say they're from Boeing and, and Lockheed Martin, <laughs> because all they care about <laughs> is the defense industry. And, you know, you, you have to ask yourselves, you know, like, what, what can you, be, uh, I guess I, as a Catholic, I feel like Israel, of course, has a right to defend itself as long as the response is proportionate. Justified. And, and morally yeah. justified. And I, I, you know, like they should, but again, I'm not like some of these Christian conservatives who think like Israel, which is a totally secular state, is somehow like, right. you get these evangelical Christians or whatever, they just think Israel is like, you know God's promise, and we we as Americans right. have an well, obligation. There's a reason for that, right? The four horsemen because, are coming. Because yeah. don't they believe that that Jews have to own that strip basically for rapture? I think. Yeah, exactly. There's, like, they, there's yeah, there's some type of religious justification for why evangelicals. There's are, a group. There's a group. Yeah, group. right. It's just like it, it just again. So what you get is this chaotic sense of U.S. foreign policy because you have you know warmongers and also this weird like end of the world belief regarding Israel, you know, on, on, on the GOP side. And on the Democratic side, you have um, actually a large number of senators that are Jewish and are pro-Israel. And I, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but Chuck Schumer is the leader of the Democrats in the Senate. Fe Feinstein just passed away. She was Jewish. A lot of Jewish senators. But then you also have this weird thing where you have that far left, which is like super anti-Israel, you know, you have members of the squad who are pro Hamas. It's just you have just a very strange situation in both political parties where having like a normal common sense policy of saying Israel is not sinless, but not 
totally evil either. They should be able to defend themselves. They should not be disproportionate in the response. We should try to help them out here and there, but like, don't try to fight their wars for them. It just seems like- Don't solve their problems yeah. for right. them. And, and right. it's like, it just seems like, I don't know, I would call that kind of normal. Yeah. And I think for me too, one of the points that Vivek made in his interview with Tucker about this was that- you know, having we need to step back and realize that there's a lot of selective moral outrage going on. That you know, this yes, this was an outrageous attack. This should never happen. This is bestial. It's terrible what happened in those kibbutzes and in southern Israel. But there's a lot else going on here. I mean, you you pointed out the Christian minorities who suffered after we withdrew from Iraq. I mean, we look at the slaughter in Kurdistan. Um, last week, we highlighted Armenia and Azerbaijan and the, the terrible suffering that is going on Ar there. Armenia is an ethnic cleansing. It's, it's, it's akin with World War with the Nazis. Like the Nazis used Armenia as a playbook for how to ethnically cleanse that region from Christians. And you never hear, you never hear anything about well, that. Well, that was like, that was why some people were concerned about letting Turkey into NATO. And it's like this, it's this difficult situation where they're a key ally in many ways, but they they probably helped Hamas in this attack. And they, like you say, what they did with the Armenians. So it's like, you know, it's like, it's a tough call. It's like the, the consensus is, do you want Turkey close enough as your friend that you can, you know, try to control them? Keep your enemies I, close. You know, I, yeah, it? but it's, uh, I don't know if I believe that. Uh, it's tough. And rightfully, rightfully so, Trump is offering a different vision, which, to his credit, and a lot of the reason he got elected in 2016 was, uh, guys, our southern border is wide open. Um, I think Tucker brought up a stat about deaths that come from fentanyl in America or drugs. Like We have people dying in our major cities from fentanyl overdoses or drug overdoses living basically half dead. Um, those numbers are on par with uh, war deaths. I mean, we basically have our own version of war, soft war that's going on in our own cities and our own towns here. Like, first off, we need to close our border. Second off, we need to use money to actually help Americans suffering here at home. So to get whipped up, it's just e an easier story to sell, I think, that like, oh, this is a terrorist group hit someone. We need to help them because it's so clear like who the enemy is. But we've, of course, lost sight. And why are we having these dumb disputes in Congress when like, I don't know. You guys see it. Like your your major city, like we have real problems here. That and part of it that's, is just that's Trump's message. There's the way news happens. So if 1,500 people die from terrorist attacks, you know, on a, on one day, it's a wow. As opposed to if 25, 35, 100 people die every day over the course of months and months and months and months from fentanyl, it's like and they're scattered all over right, the country. Right, and it's right. it's just. Mm -hmm. it's it doesn't it's a slow terrible death. Right, it's not as sexy for sure. Yeah, so it's harder to. To, to get, it's harder to grab the attention of the American people, but that's why, you know, when it comes to the media, you need to be able to have that uh, ability to step back a little bit and put things in perspective. I think that's what we're trying to do here with the Loopcast. We're not going to say that we did everything perfectly right on this stuff because the, the, the Middle East is a very complex situation, but we just wish that our, uh, our, our lawmakers... Uh, the news pundits and everyone else involved in this situation would have a little bit more uh, sobriety and humility when it comes to this kind of stuff and understand that, you know, just because the United States is a great power doesn't mean you have an unbelievable ability to just completely change all the borders and make everything right. Um, it's a lot harder than you think. We should We should have a little bit more humility after our own debacle in Iraq. Yeah, I like that. And I, I think a, the third thread here is we want to step back and we want to put things in perspective. We are all very fortunate here to share the same faith. And it'd be really hard to categorize in your mind the different events that are happening around the world or even within our country and still keep this inner peace unless you had an understanding that temporal things pass away and that our, our eternal home is heaven. And to keep our eyes fixed on that. And I think specifically regarding this, people feel very anxious about the war and about things going on at home. And in the month of the rosary, I, I, I want to, not to go all Pastor Tom or whatever, uh, my, pastor, my pastor at my, my church gave a great homily about 
uh, Our Lady of Victory, now known as Our Lady of the Rosary, and October, the month of the Rosary, uh, war and tension and strife, and even like Josh said, like America's a power now, who knows where we'll be in a hundred years. Uh, life might not be always as we understand it. And the best thing that you can do is to pray earnestly to God uh, for one, the repose of the soul for all these people that are, are affected in the Middle East, uh, for pray for peace. Uh, many times Our Lady has come forward and specifically requested our, uh, us to pray the rosary for peace. But even in the Battle of Lepanto, like in a time where basically uh, the Holy League in the 1500s uh, was on the brink of destruction, the Turks had a much bigger uh, naval fleet, the Holy League had a few ships, essentially. And uh, Pope Pius V said, pray the rosary, open up all the churches to save um, Christendom. And Our Lady saved Christendom. They provided this victory that by all stretch of projections is impossible um, because of course nothing is impossible with God. So I think a lot of this just put in perspective, like many people have lived throughout. We have this unusual time of peace that we've lived through. Most people in their lives have experienced a major war. We're talking like you know, well, a world war or war that they know someone that was involved with. I know we did go through Iraq and Afghanistan, right, but I, not not to the scale of World War II. I think and it wasn't on our home territory, right? Right. Well, it was on our home territory. My city got attacked. No, um, I think that's, I, I understand what you mean, though. Like, the taste of war has been shared by too few in this country. So, even though we've been at war over the last 20 years, most of this 21st century has been, the United States has been at war. Um, it's been, the number of people who have served in the military is smaller than it's ever been before. So the number of people who have military experience or have, have felt the pain is smaller than it had been, you know. When I, when I grew up, the number, you know, my dad had served in Vietnam, my my grandfathers had served in World War II. Everyone had, you know, and my neighbor, he was in Korea. So the number of people I knew that had military experience for fought in wars was a lot higher than it is now. It's just, there's a lot fewer people that have that experience, but I just want to make sure we understand that, yeah, they're definitely, we're still at war. Just a smaller population that having to bear that brunt and pray for them. You know, every, what is it, every 22 minutes? Uh, a member who served in the, in the military commits suicide. It's a harrowing statistic. And, you know, there's a lot of hardship and pain. And so when Trump came along in 2015 and said, these wars are are stupid, they're horrible, and the casualties from it are are not over just when the battle stops. If I could ask a, a, a personal question to both of you, you know, we go through a lot of news, and so maybe... We have to see more than most people, but I think most people, you know, have popped on the news or popped on Twitter or whatever, and have kind of seen a lot of the videos coming out of this. Uh, how do you, and what advice would you give to someone to maintain a level of peace and not become so upset seeing everything that they're seeing right now? Right. I think I spent a lot of time researching this and I definitely, it was, it was very difficult to like have your head in it because the, the images coming out are really disturbing kind of like watching Holocaust film footage, for sure, not kind of, it's very similar. Um, I, again, this is not just a platitude, but I sincerely believe the only way to maintain a true vision of what suffering in the world means is prayer, and and specifically reading the scriptures and staying close to the word of God, which is not only speaking to us from you know, the time that it was written. So, you know, reading the book of Isaiah is particularly comforting to me because not only is he talking about a time when the Assyrians are invading and there, there's all kinds of wars happening, but it's also God speaking to us now in this moment. Um, and it's the inspired word of God. So I think staying close to the scriptures in our prayer um, and maintaining that conversation with God is absolutely central to not getting down about you know the what's going on in the world and who's yelling what about nuke who and um yeah i think as christians that's what we can bring to the world is that interior peace if we're close to god through his word i i'm always careful about like you know not ingesting a media diet that will make you feel horrible 
you know, we try to, for example, with the loop, be straight and honest with stuff, but we're not going to try to attack your senses. Um, you know, we'll be honest about what's going on. But I feel like, you know, you don't have to actually put your face into a pile of mud to know that it's raining outside. Yeah, I loved the readings this past Sunday, especially after the news coming out. But the second reading was from Philippians, and it's it's the reading that you know we quote a lot in classical education. So whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is beautiful, meditate on these things. And I don't think Saint Paul is saying, okay, like just ignore what's going on in the world. No bad things, lollipops, sunshine, and rainbow unicorns, which is like the world my four year old lives in. But I think he's saying it's it's important to keep in mind that yes. We want to have a realistic sense, like Josh says, and, and the truth of what happens as a result of sin, but also to know that what is good and true and beautiful will have the final say. And I love this quote that uh, that you threw in the notes, Tom, from Thomas More, because he's one patron of Catholic vote, uh, but also a personal patron of mine. And he, he said, a man may very well lose his head and yet come to no harm. And he did lose his head. So, I mean, he talked from experience, right, or something. A man may very well lose his head and come to no harm. Yea, I say to unspeakable good and everlasting happiness. Um, and again, like that example of the saints is so powerful. So if you haven't read a saint biography in a while and you're feeling like, oh my gosh, the four horsemen are galloping through my front door, maybe that would be a great thing to do this week is pick up the life of Thomas More. Talk about people comfortable with death, man. Nothing, nothing more than the saints. The saints had a very unique relationship with death uh that hopefully we can all get to one day it's hard for me <laughs> well and um, you know it doesn't yeah. it doesn't come natural you know thomas more that wasn't natural right you know all these others he did he wasn't born like i can't wait to have my head chopped yeah. up yeah all the yeah. rest of them peter paul all the you know it's not like they're like oh sure whatever kill me yeah that, it, it only comes from an inner peace it only comes when you know you try to bring yourself closer to christ and and his love that's yeah, it's supernatural. I think that uh, the concept of history too is important and Erica kind of brought it up and I feel like we continue to bring it up. Like the reason we went through the context on this is because it's everything feels uh, unprecedented and scary and new if you don't understand history. And it's like, what's that that trend going around? It's like, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's awesome. Which is funny. Uh, Josh, Josh and I have gone back and forth on that. But it, it is true. Like I, I when I have like, studied Rome, Rome has experienced everything we have and more. Uh, and if you knew that, you wouldn't be as surprised when, you know, we deal with inflation or we deal with military disputes or we deal with uh, bread and circuses. Like this is well, all or with uh, with the Synod. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to look <laughs> at current church events and think, oh my gosh, this is the end of the Catholic Church. Or, oh my God, there's so much of awe and like lose your head. But if you have a, a sense of history, you, it's much harder to lose your peace if you know, okay, there's been the Arian heresy and mm -hmm. the Protestant rebellion. Well, it makes you on. think that, you know, when you look at the Roman Empire and all the things that had happened to it and understanding, you know, the reach of a very large national, uh, international power and you realize, yeah, maybe we do need that humility. Maybe we should think twice before we start foreign wars. Maybe we should take care of our people at home. And my goodness, Pat Buchanan was a prophet. <laughs> I sometimes think when I'm parenting my children that this is like God's vision of world history too, because how many times do I have to repeat to them like, shut the front door or don't touch the stove, don't do this, don't do, and it's like over and over again, and they keep doing the same thing. And parenting is so much, and it's just looking at world history, it's like, there go the humans again, getting embroiled in foreign wars and doing the same thing. And it's not like we don't know what's going to happen here, people. But God, our Holy Father, must our Heavenly Father must just be like. Okay, Erica. All right, Twilight Zone. So I'm going to return to our border here. This was a great story. So Biden is, uh, President Biden's administration, they're going to go ahead and out of an abundance of caution, they are going to build a large physical obstruction along our southern border. They're going to put up 20 more miles not of a wall. We don't want to call it a wall, but don't use the W word, please. A barrier. So they're going to continue the barrier construction, add 20 miles. In order to do this, President Biden, uh, with the help of his handy, trusty servant, Mayorkas, 
Uh, They're waiving 26 laws that protect South Texas wildlife, various local communities, including indigenous land, Native American burial grounds, and the like, so that they can finally do something. But here's the Twilight Zone. This was like watching the head spin around in The Exorcist or something. Don't watch that. But anyway, head spinning around. So on October 5th, Mayorkas comes out in front of the press and he goes, we are building this wall. It's going to keep out migrants. It's going to bring order. And quote, he said, there is presently an acute and immediate need to construct physical barriers and roads in the vicinity of the border of the United States in order to prevent unlawful entries into the United States in the project areas. So notice there's no wall there. But Mayorkas is like, this is actually going to solve problems. Three hours later, Corinne Jean-Pierre comes out in front of the White House press corps and says, we have no choice. We know that walls don't work, but Congress is making us because we are a law-abiding administration. We're going to follow Congress's orders. And when she was challenged by Peter Ducey from Fox News, it's like, why don't you guys just not do it like you do with, you know, student loan repayments and everything else? <laughs> she was like, do you want us to break the law? I can't believe you're suggesting this. Three hours later, Biden goes on one of his very rare interviews, and he sits down and says to the interviewer, walls don't work. I tried to get Congress to get rid of this. It was an appropriation bills. Walls don't work. October 6th, the next morning, Mayorkas comes out again in front of the press, quote, From day one, this administration has made clear that a border wall is not the answer. That remains our position, and our position has never wavered. So it was like a 24-hour poor, I mean, I I don't pity Mayorkas because, man, he has messed up. But watching the whole, like, machine spin him around 180 degrees was just classic. It was a classic. You saw him, Biden, say early in his presidency, like, we're not going to put one more brick of the wall down. Like we're not. Oh, 100%. Okay, right. I mean, want to make his sure campaign we're all was he like said, Trump's yeah. wall is dumb. So how do you think like the meeting went where they all had to sit down and were like, <laughs> oh my gosh, we have to, we actually have to build a wall. This is, wh- what do you mean we have to build a wall? Like, no, the appropriations bill said we have to. What? We have to build a wall? How are we going to tell people that? I mean, I think they have nothing left. They have, they, they have completely failed to secure the southern border. Walls do work, as subsequent studies have shown from areas where we have barriers up. And so they're like, well, I mean, we got to do something. You need a, you know, you need actually, a study to tell you that the wall works? Actually, <laughs> it's kind of funny that you think about it now, though, because with you have your, um, New York City Mayor Eric Adams calling for restrictions on the He's border. He's flying down there. Now you have the Biden administration calling for you know a border. So really the Building a wall. Yeah. So really you're left with who is the only person who really thinks that we should just have a wide open border? I guess it's just, oh, the U.S. bishops. Oh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) He said it. It's true. (laughs) They did have a statement this week in support of, I don't even know who they were supporting, but. It defies logic. They're in support of chaos. Yeah. They're in support of chaos. Yeah. Hey, and I just have to say, too, if you want more on Catholic Vote's take on the immigration issue, Brian Birch, our president, fearless president, had a fantastic op-ed on that. Oh, so good. This week in the loop. So dig back and, and read that. Well, Check your email. Speaking of bishops, uh, I get to I, I get to talk about the Synod because, you know, Congrats. the Synod's going on. It's a hot topic. A lot of people liked our thumbnail of uh, Cardinal Sarah pulling the fire alarm, the <laughs> imaginary fire alarm at the Synod. That's so, a great thumbnail. I mean, this quote just really just works on its own. I don't even really need to add much to it. Father Timothy Radcliffe at the start of uh, a synod session started with, quote, so, so many people feel excluded and marginalized in our church because we have slapped abstract labels on them, divorced and remarried, gay people, poly- polygamous people, refugees, Africans, and Jesuits. You know, I think there's Let a lot indulge of indulge a small giggle. I think there's a lot of conservative Catholics in the United States would be more than happy to allow the the Catholic Church to be run by an African by the name of you know Renze or Sarah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have a problem with Africans actually. Nope. Have I'm you seen good. the thing that Trinitine Brewing's been doing? Like, are you familiar with Midjourney? Yeah, yeah. It's an AI. So it's a, it's the same thing that the Trump the Trump history guys oh, do with oh, AI oh, technology, okay. but he, they make like fake. Pictures just that for are like fun, really right? high quality of yeah. stuff. 
for fun. Just for fun. It's and like a satire. So they've site done a slash. series. Trinity Brewing's done a series where they they imaginary make Cardinal Sarah the Pope, the Pope. and have him do a bunch of things. So he's like, <laughs> said Pope Pope Sarah, or I, I can't remember what the Pope name he was given, but like Pope Sarah never takes questions on an airplane about American Catholics, <laughs> and it's just a picture of him sitting on the very around her quarters, head down, praying a rosary. <laughs> It's awesome. Yeah. I think it's ironic too. I mean, I was reading Father Timothy Radcliffe is a Dominican and just I, I like I love me and my Dominicans, but this guy, he's been giving these reflections. He's been giving these reflections at the start of the synod uh sessions and this the the quote Tom gave us is just a sampling of the Sidonese Sample. that he subjects the listeners to. And what's abstract I'm about looking, being a Jesuit? I'm confused. I'm still confused. Or abstract, being African. Like you are or you aren't. I mean, right. Come on. So, okay. Right. Or, yeah. And like, he's like, oh, all these labels that we give to people, divorced, remarried, gay people, polygamous people. I don't know anyone who like walks into a local parish for Sunday mass and it's like, oh, there's the polygamous people <laughs> over there. Oh, there's the gay person. Oh, they're like, if you're, I, I just... I feel like it's the synod that is telling us there's all these labels, like they're the ones slapping labels on onto people. It's just they're so great at creating straw men and destroying them right before our eyes. Wow, oh my gosh, so brave! Yeah. All right, Josh, move on to yours. Well, I mean, you know, I it's just kind of ridiculous. The San Diego Public Library has decided to uh, invite the anti-Catholic drag queen troop, whatever, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence to screen an R-rated movie. You know, and again, this just, it, to me, it just strikes me as, uh, I don't know how to say hilarious, just weird. I mean, like, am I offended? Well, I guess, sure, because I think that, but the biggest thing I have with this is that the whole, everything about the drag queen thing is is, horrendous on its own because it's trying to pretend that being a woman is a costume. Yeah. And I know we're getting close to Halloween. That sounds like an abstract label to me. I'm offended. That's abstract. Yeah, it's like, it's literally, it's not just something the way you dress or something you wear and then suddenly you're a woman. It's There's more to the essence of who we are as people. Like, this is male and this is female. It's not just a costume. But of course, they're not just drag queens. They're mocking religious sisters and using names that, you know, are vile it's hypersexualized stuff and so the question is like wait a minute is this a is this a public you know it's one thing when a sports team does it stupidly and it gives it a broad reach which i thought was bad but actually the taxpayers in san diego are forced to pay for this library and this is what they're being subjected to so it's just it really is just a farce and a joke and and not a funny one at that obviously and Catholics have a right to be upset. And it, again, it gets to this point where you can offend Catholics and that's seemingly okay. But if they had done it about any other faith or religion or creed, then, you know, everyone would have been up in arms. So I feel like um, the abstract label of Catholic you've put on me makes me feel a little excluded and marginalized. <laughs> so hopefully they <laughs> let me into the Nothing abstract about being Catholic. If Catholics were to write in, which they should, to the library in protest, and in fact, any taxpayer of goodwill should write in and be like, look, I don't want, you shouldn't force me to spend my money on this. It's not just, it, primarily, yes, where, you know, they should not be allowing this sort of blasphemous mockery of women or religion, or religion. But at the same time, I think this, was this the same event with the poster of the, the child on it? And there's a group of drag queens hovering over this child right. in, the, in the image, and the child is in drag. And the the tagline is like sexual anarchy right under this child's face. Always a wonderful so, thing. Yeah, right. Regardless of if you're Catholic, Jewish, whatever, but this is literally like sexualizing a child. That that child is a real person somewhere who was put up to this. With the sexual revolution, we had this weird thing at the beginning, at least for the first generation or two, where. Uh, adult men and women said, we can act and think pornographically as long as we keep the innocence of our children okay. But that was- an, uh, It's in the privacy of our bedroom. Right. right? It's not going to affect And him. But then it spills over to every media outlet everywhere. And so it, that's not sustainable. It's like, you know, just because you're married 
or you're an adult or whatever, it doesn't mean you should have a totally pornified brain, which men and women are both having. What you need to do is still have, you know, a sense of propriety in, you know, properness and and not just be completely satiated by lust. Because this is what happens of over time, then you think, well, this is totally normal. This is the way everything always is. Then why would I not allow children to have that same fun that I'm having? And you get all sorts of disasters. So it's like, no, like you're fueling a whole terrible. Great. And I think like children, children who grew up around alcoholism have an understanding that there's no such thing as a private addiction. So right. when we're saying like, well, if I'm addicted to porn in my bedroom or I'm addicted to alcohol, you know, just in the privacy of my own living room, that's, you know, that's me. Like, it's not affecting you. Why are you so upset about it? That's never true about human addiction and porn and you know, gay porn, all, all of it. It's an addiction and it is going to hurt other people. So, yeah, I'm concerned about what you're doing in the privacy of your bedroom. The broader the lens that you're talking about is an understanding of vice and virtue. Like there's right. no such thing mm-hmm. as private vice. If you continue to commit vices, right. you will it begets more vice. If you continue to v- commit virtue, it begets more virtue. It's not like you like you can segment your life and to be like I'm going to be vicious in this area, but I'll be virtuous in all the others. Like no, you you go further down that path. So it's important to seek virtue in all areas of your life. That's why Catholicism, Catholicism, once again, wisdom of the timeless church here, uh, there are norms like like there's a there way to see human dignity, especially in uh, intimacy. And if you're not trying to pursue virtue in that intimacy, it begets all these problems that we're seeing right now in terms of all the deviancy publicly. Right. Um, and it started off with, let me do whatever I want in my bedroom. That that does not that precedent does not apply to anything else in life. In that this is just going to stay in its little place and not be anywhere. It's like, well, how could we be so naive to think this? So once again, it goes back to like the Greeks with vice and virtue. Yeah, it's, actually. It's, and, and Fulton Sheen had a good quote. I loved it so much. She says, if you don't behave as you believe, you will end up believing as you behave. And so what ends up happening yes, is that over time, fire. you justify the private vices you've ex- invited into your life. And then you think it's normal. And then you, in order to justify it, you have to then go on the offense and say, this is good for all people. Why would we say it's somehow only acceptable once you turn 18? It should be, everyone should embrace this. And so you become these ambassadors of lust. It's like this crazy thing. And I think a lot of parents are starting to wake up and realize, wait a minute, why? what is the purpose of this? Why, why are they trying to get kids into this? They're trying to justify what they're doing. That's an episode on its own. Yeah, but so the, yeah, I feel the another hour of, coming on. The origins of the the flag, let's just say, unfortunately, have some pedophilic uh, elements to it. But uh, it's time for the review, and Josh, you're sticking around for this one because it involves you. So we have honest and vibrant. Uh, this was given on Monday. I love the perspective on this show. Josh is so much more informed on the inner workings of American politics than I ever will be. Erica always brings well researched view- viewpoints and info with her motherly presence. And Tom and Tom does a good job of bringing it all together. Also, the only podcast that has ever given feedback when I've written in, which is much appreciated. Nice to know the audience is truly heard. Praying for you all. Uh, it's just kind of a c- collection of letters. Otherwise, I'd give credit. But thank you so much for, for writing in. That was a really nice review. And yes, I do read Aww. your comments. And yes, I do try to give good feedback. Not always timely, unfortunately, but I try my best. So if you want to contribute to that, if you want to let us know that you're listening and you appreciate what we're doing, Apple Podcasts, you can go leave us five stars, write a review like that. Spotify, another place you can leave us reviews. And then the inbox, if you want to talk to us, loopcast at catholicvote.org. Um, we also have a YouTube channel right now on Catholic Vote. Uh, if you want to like and subscribe there, really appreciate it. You want to come see in person Josh's amazing knowledge of American history and Erica's motherly presence, uh, <laughs> we're there on YouTube. So uh, we appreciate all of you so much. Hopefully that uh, we, had, we gave you some education and lifted you up in this one. That was our point. We're not claiming to be experts on foreign relations, but hopefully we can make it a little bit clearer for you here. And uh, until then, we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Bye.